Hey, I'm JJ Hazing. I'm a pro programmer to develop VR. I'm leading up the uh, SDK that I'll be talking about here. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of kind of what Envelope for Windows is and what you can do with our SDK, and then I'll kind of go into details. Um, so has anyone here used Envelope for Windows at all? Okay. One. Okay. <laughs> That's good. So um, it's actually uh, currently on Steam. You can download it. It's a free download. Um, if you use things like virtual desktop or big screen, um, it's like that with kind of a few twists. Um, all of your applications come out and are broken out into their own windows in space rather than just being on one big desktop. And then on top of that, we have our SDK layer, which I'll be talking about. So let me show a little video of kind of how it works. So you see your normal Windows taskbar at the bottom of the screen, and we'll fire up Microsoft Word, and you can drag it around. Um, and then you select it, go over, and then you just start typing. As, as you can see, we have a webcam aimed at the keyboard so that you can uh, kind of get a feel for where your hands are when you're typing if you're not a perfect touch typist or anything like that. Um, here's a web browser. Um, as you can see, it's broken out into its own window. And this is our developer portal. This is where we host all of the documentation and samples for uh, Envelope. And this is kind of showing the basics of whatever SDK can do. Here's a live coding sample where you just click play in a browser and there's a sea of cubes in your environment all running in JavaScript in the browser, um, but then extending into the full 3D environment. And that's what we'll be talking about mostly today. Um, and here we're changing all live in the browser, blue to green, complete with autocomplete, and IntelliSense, change the size on the boxes a little bit. We'll be going into this in a little more detail. Click play, and there you have slightly bigger green cubes instead of the smaller blue cubes. And again, all running in the web browser in a live code editor. And then we also have a .NET SDK. And in this case, we've created a plugin for Excel. So you bring up Excel in another window, and uh, Select some data, click a button for a scatter plot, and we've extended Excel into VR, um, all with the .NET plugin using our SDK. Um, so these are just a few samples of what you can do. And we have a full transform gizmo for, um, you can create your own interactions with objects or you can just use our standard transform gizmo if you want something quick and easy to implement. And then I think the next one I'll be covering later, so I'll, yeah, stop the video short there. But as you can see, multiple windows all in the environment. You can place them wherever you want. You can spin the environment around you and the windows move with it and stuff like that. So a little teaser of the car there. Yeah. Oh, and I just closed PowerPoint. All right. So we kind of call it our toe dipping strategy. You don't have to like create a full VR application to be a VR programmer. You can extend an existing application. You have you already have all your application logic, but you want a little VR on the side. Um, that's what we're aiming to do. Um, not that you can can't do full applications either. Um, so we have the SDK, and then we actually have the application that hosts the uh, SDK. Um, and the various things you can do, you can inject models into VR. Uh, you know, some of the business cases are, you know, your users can decide, is this tent too big? You know, if they're on Amazon, they bring a tent up. No, that tent's too small. You know, I, I, I need a bigger tent, you know, because there's the tent right in front of you. So you get better purchasing, purchasing decisions. Um, collaboration, uh, it's easier to tell things, you know, just compare data or objects when you're in VR rather than just on a 2D web page. Um, 
uh, one of the classic examples is like say an Amazon or some other storefront, there's your chair, you know, is it big enough for me? All right, so here's the car demo. This kind of getting to kind of the, the meat of it. Um, so this is all in a web page. You have a Cadillac car configurator uh, and you click show in VR and there's your car. You're interacting with it with your touch controllers. Um, you don't like the red car, you can change the paint color. Again, interacting with the web page, complete with the touch controllers. Um, all the application logic is running in JavaScript in the web page. Our SDK is entirely JavaScript. It's actually written in TypeScript, but that's it. If you have questions about that, come talk to me. It's, it's an implementation detail. But when you want to see the inside of the car, you click the inside. And there you are. And so do I fit in this car? Or do I have enough headroom? How's the reach to the steering wheel? Um, all sorts of interesting applications for extending not only applications, but web pages into the VR. Um, so a little overview of how the SDK actually works. Um, it's actually based on WebSockets. So we host a WebSocket API in Envelope for Windows. And then the web page creates a WebSocket connection. This is all handled for you. You don't have to worry about it. This is kind of how it works if anyone cares about these implementation details. Um, but one key aspect of this is it's entirely asynchronous. And the nice thing about that is, um, you know, the headsets are running 90 hertz. You miss frames. It doesn't feel good for the user. You know, you cover up with uh, async time warp and things like that. But uh, in this case, your application doesn't have to run a 90. It doesn't have to worry about running 90. All the calls are asynchronous, and then we deal with all the heavy lifting for rendering objects at 90 hertz behind the scenes for you. Um, it's all handle-based because it's asynchronous, so you get handles to objects, you trade objects, you get handles back. Um, um, like I said, it's, we have a JavaScript layer. Um, that's actually written in TypeScript, so you get full type information if that's the kind of thing you like. If you're a big JavaScript developer and happen to like TypeScript, you can totally do that, or you can ignore it and just use the JavaScript straight up. Um, we also run headless in Node.js. If you have an application where you want your logic running in Node and then uh, uh, you don't need to actually run in a browser, you can just run in Node straight on the... Um, and then we also have a .NET player, so which also uses the WebSocket API, and that supports .NET Core, UAP, and interestingly, Unity. So you could actually do all your logic in Unity if you wanted to, and then it will talk to us for doing the rendering into the headset. Um, and the, again, the cool part of this is the application doesn't take over the headset. You still see your windows. You still see other applications running at the same time. Um, it's not exclusive mode. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's heavily threaded, though. So it's, uh, we do a lot of work to make sure we keep frame rate up. So you can still drown it with content if you really, you know, put a lot of stuff in there. Um, we have some, you know, safeguards like uh, limits on resources that you can create and stuff like that. So um, we do have a native layer, but currently it's internal only. But that's something we could expose to the end user if we wanted uh, for both local in-process native applications and remote native WebSocket clients. Um, but for now, we kind of focus on the JavaScript and .NET. Um, and I'll show you how our samples web page works. Um, so you just go to our web page, web page and go to the SDK docs, samples. And uh, I was kind of showing you you know, you have, this is actually Visual Studio Code, the Visual Studio Editor for web type stuff, uh, fully embedded in our web page, um, complete with an, all the IntelliSense and everything like that. Um, I already showed you this, so I'll kind of skip over it. I don't think, uh, let's see. Um, now, within the SDK, we have some basic terminology that if you're, how many people have used Unity or Unreal? Like, okay, most people. So meshes, materials, and then blueprint. A blueprint is, so you create your meshes, you create your materials, then you create a blueprint which assigns the mesh and the material together. 
Um, and once you have that blueprint, uh, you instantiate it. Um, you can instantiate it hundreds of times if you want to see a cubes, and you just have the one blueprint, and then you have a bunch of instances. Um, and you get a handle back to all these, so you can delete them, change them, things like that. Um, I'll, can we do questions afterwards, if you don't? Yeah, it's cool. Um, and then one other thing we have is observers. Since this is entirely asynchronous, uh, um, you can observe things and get values back. Like, I want to know this transform over time. I want to know where the user's hands are. Um, you'll get this, uh, asynchronous events back into your web page or application saying, hey, the hands have moved. Here's their new pose. Um, and again, all asynchronous, so you don't have to really worry about frame rate and things like that as much. Um, the observers also work the other way. So you can say, I'm observing the material properties on an object, say the car, I want to change the paint to yellow. So I take the handle for the car uh, observer for the material and say, hey, set the paint flex to a different shade of yellow or something like that. So kind of a, a loose overview of how things work. Um, so kind of getting into it a little bit. Uh, You know, say like the lawn chair or the car, you know, you'll, you'll usually have that hosted on a web page somewhere. So we have a full create blueprint from URL. Um, I'll show you that in just a second. Um, and the way the content pipeline works is you create your FBX files like usual. Um, we actually export from Unity currently. There's not a direct path. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But um, you can also do custom loaders. Like um, if you have proprietary formats, you know, we, we accept hey, here's a vertex buffer and index buffer, and so you can do your own custom loaders however you want. Um, we've actually integrated a little bit with some of the 3JS loaders um, for loading other formats than what we support. And then there's entirely procedural, so like the Excel plugin is um, uh, creating objects on the fly for like the coordinates system and stuff like that. Um, and that's all just custom procedural geometry that's created on the fly. And we also have had like a Maya visualizer. So the Maya was sending across the mesh data and then we would render it and you could do manipulations and send the information back and stuff like that. So those are the kind of meshes we currently support. Um, so here's the code of kind of how that works. Um, so you say, hey, I'm gonna create a cube blueprint and I just, uh, there's a scene object there, and I say, hey, create the blueprint from the URL, and here's the actual file to load, and there you have a blueprint. And then below it, you just instantiate it um, by calling instantiate on the actual blueprint handle. Um, and in this case, it's taking a matrix that is created. We, we internally currently use GeoMatrix, um, which is just a math library. Um, but you can use whatever math library you want as long as it kind of gives us an array of floats in the matrix format we care about. In this case, we're saying, hey, create a matrix from a rotation, a translation, and a scale, you know, but it's really just any. There we go. Cool. Yeah, let me know if you need to swap it out. Okay. Um, and units are in meters, so cool. So what's going on here? So this is a geometry sample, and you can see the different types of uh, geometry formats we support, and it'll show, you know, there's vertex lit, unlit, and, you know, here's some vertex colors on there, um, et cetera. So, um, and you just specify an index buffer and a vertex buffer. It's, Pretty low level, but if you want to skip all that, you just import an FBX from Unity and call it a day. Um, we also have standard resources. If you've ever prototyped a game using all cubes and stuff like that, and it's kind of an easy way to do it. So uh, uh, we just say, hey, go ahead and create me a cube or a sphere or a quad and some green material, red material, blue material. Um, so nice and easy. You don't actually have to create content. You just start attaching cubes to the controllers and painting with cubes and drawing spheres everywhere. It's a lot of fun. So, you know, you can throw together a quick little simplistic version of Tilt Brush in about 20 lines of JavaScript or something like that, just using standard materials, uh, standard resources. 
Um, so standard materials we have on lit, lit ones, just some of the primary colors and a few other things. So enough to do prototyping. Beyond that, you create fully custom materials or uh, when you import content from Unity, you just create one of their standard materials and we bring it across um, pretty much intact for the most part. And then we also have a full scene graph uh, API. Um, so you get a hierarchy of elements. Um, and you can do parenting. And um, so one of the best examples of that, how many people have used Tilt Brush? Okay, so the UI hangs off your controller. You got a palette there, you point to stuff with the other thing. You move the controller around, the palette's going with you. You just parent those objects to uh, that hand. And uh, the cool part about that in this case is, am I getting feedback or something? Um, uh, since it's parented, there's no latency. Um, it's all running in the application. So you don't have to do application logic running in the browser to say, update it as the hand moves around. It's just attached to the hand. So there is no latency. Same with, you know, so. That, that's just one of the niceties of our system being fully asynchronous is you don't really have to worry about that stuff as much of when you're doing simple stuff like UI attached to a hand. Um, you can also do the helmet style UIs if you really wanted to. Um, so here's a little sample of how that kind of works. Again, running in the web page in the docs. Um, everything's parented to the yellow sphere in the middle, so I rotate that, everything goes with it. And then the, everything on the left is grouped together. So to the red thing, so I can rotate that. Do a little bit of scaling. Similar things on the right side. And again, rather than spheres, think UI or more complex object setups. Um, and then when you move the, or scale the parent, everything else goes along with it, complete with their previous transforms. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you do more than just spheres, but hey, spheres are fun to start with. Okay. And here I'll go into another case of parenting, like I was talking about, like the Iron Man style UI. I pick up my controllers and then I'm going through and kind of creating some spheres and stuff and instantiating them. But I'm instantiating them parented to the controllers. So the left and the right controller. So when I hit play, boom, there's spheres attached to the controllers. I don't have to worry about updating anything in the uh, actual application logic. It all happens within the envelope for Windows application itself in the runtime at 90 frames a second. So um, that's basically how that works. Talk about observers. Um, again, it's all asynchronous. You can get state asynchronously. You can set state asynchronously. Um, you can get controller state, button state, um, mouse state, like button clicks, uh, trigger positions, uh, stick positions, um, transforms. So I want to know when that scene graph thing is spinning around, I want to know the position of an object for firing off particle systems or something like that. I can get the transforms um, in an asynchronous callback. And the same thing with material properties, um, primarily for setting in that case. But um, that's kind of what we have going on with the observers. So yeah, like if you want to know the user's head uh, in your web application, you just say, hey, scene, the devices, the head, I want to know the local to world transform and I'm going to subscribe to it. And then this callback happens asynchronously um, every time we send an updated head position and we can get the, uh, the position and the orientation of the head and do interesting things with that. Um, one nice thing to do uh, is, you know, create headspace UI and things like that. So, you know, I want to pop up a UI. I can 
Um, there are other ways to do it, but that's one example. You know, you get the head position and then I can create things. Or if I want to know kind of where the user's looking, things like that um, are kind of what you would do with like an HMD observer. Same thing with controller, only in this case, we also get the press buttons and the touch buttons. Um, and you can differentiate between the left controller and the right controller. Um, we handle that all kind of behind the scenes. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of the SDK. Um, did you wanna come up and yeah. give a talk? Cool. And it, um, so everything's on the SDK docs webpage. Um, which has all of our samples and all our documentation, and then all of the actual um, JavaScript and TypeScript uh, SDKs and the .NET SDKs are all hosted on our GitHub, which is linked to from our SDK docs page. Um, and so we do all the updates on GitHub. And if you post issues there, we'll look at them. Um, um, we also have a Gitter, but I'd probably focus on using the GitHub issues page if anyone has stuff they wanna talk about there or anything like that. Um, we also have a forums you can check out. Again, I'll link to from the SDK docs page. Um, so yeah, cool. thanks. Awesome. So JJ covered a, a, a lot of it. Um, and I'm sure some of you are wondering, okay, you can do all of this cool stuff with this SDK, but so what, right? Um, I, I think the important part to remember here is that you can use all of these techniques to extend any application into VR, right? And if you want to prototype something quickly or just make your own VR applet, you can do that on this SDK too. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you are actually programmers and how many of you have, so, so I'll just do programmers first, how many of you are programmers? Okay, so half the room. And then how many of you have developed in VR? Okay, so everyone who's a programmer. Um, so some of the things I'm gonna go over when it comes to code, um, those of you who aren't programmers, it's gonna probably seem a little bit too complex. We can go into detail later. Uh, we'll, we'll do a Q&A session afterwards, but uh, I'll gloss over some of the details around JavaScript programming and things like that. So let me start with, uh, getting into our samples page. The one thing I, I wanna show you guys is how can we create um, a really simple VR applet using this SDK? And then on top of that, you know, what are the results of it? So can we you know, create something that's compelling? And I'm gonna show you a few samples that we created using this SDK. So um, if you come to me and you're like, hey Aaron, okay, I wanna start building on the Envelop VR SDK, but I don't know what to do. Uh, the first thing that I would do is point you to our um, SDK docs page here and specifically point you to the CFQ uh, page because it kind of shows you the very basics of how to create a VR applet with the SDK. And I'm just going to go uh, semi line by line on this um, and I'll, I'll kind of gloss over some of the other details. Um, but with this, so what this demo does is it helps you understand how to create a scene, how to create a cube mesh using some of our standard resources, how to create a material, how to use that material in the mesh to create a blueprint, how to instantiate a blueprint, um, and, and basically how to rotate it and, and move it. Um, and those are some of the basic things that you need to uh, know when it comes to creating a VR applet on this SDK. Uh, the other thing that's really great about this page is that it creates what we say is a sea of cubes, right? So as soon as you hit play, there's nothing that you have to do. You should immediately see a sea of cubes in front of you. So if you don't, you know that there's some type of connection issue that you're having with the Envelop um, engine, or you know there there might be an internet connectivity issue or something that's not not working. And if you do see a sea of cubes and you try to edit the code and something doesn't work, then you know it's something wrong with your code, right? So this is a really great example for not only showing people how the SDK actually works, but also just testing and seeing if the SDK is working on your machine. Um, so the first thing we do is create a scene. Uh, we do that asynchronously, like uh, JJ said. Um, so in the first line, you see that a scene is initialized with the then statement. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with asynchronous programming and promises in JavaScript, we can maybe 
answer a question or two uh, during the Q&A session. There are some resources here on this page that uh, will route you to asynchronous programming. Um, but most of you who are dev developing in VR already know this. Uh, so we create a scene, and then we use that scene to create a mesh, to create a material. Um, and so here in the meshes, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is here, we have a list of standard uh, resources, and I'll get into that. Uh, but here we're actually creating a cube resource, and, and that's a primitive that we've created for the SDK. And we're tying it to this mesh um, variable. And then we're doing the same thing here with, uh, if you can read till the end of this, with the standard material here. And what this basically is, is just a plastic, ish blue material that we're assigning to this. We take the two, we create a blueprint, and then we say, okay, within this XYZ coordinate, we have a global coordinate system within EVE. Um, for every two units, we're gonna uh, take the position of a cube and we're going to translate it to that position of you know, every two units in, in the XYZ coordinate plane. And then we're just gonna instantiate a, a, a cube. Right, so we say, okay, we're at position zero, take a cube, zero, zero, one, or zero, zero, two, take a cube, and so forth, right? Very simple. And then from there, we basically just dispose everything within the scene. I'll get uh, a little bit uh, deeper into that. Basically, we dispose um, any handles in the scene to release any system resources, and mostly whenever you're making a call into EVE, you're taking up system resources, primarily RAM. Um, so, so that's really the basics. Uh, this is what, you know, several lines of code, and this alone can produce a large amount of objects in a VR space. You can change, you know, the object color, the properties. Um, so I, I really just think this is a great example when it comes to understanding how to prototype really quickly in this environment. Uh, so some of the other things uh, that are kind of need to knows um, is the coordinate system itself. Um, we have a page for that. Not going to go into too much detail, uh, but we have a XYZ global coordinate system. The X goes positive to the right, Y goes positive upwards, and Z goes positive outwards, like any generic um, coordinate system, yeah, uh, inwards. And we only expose the SDK to that global coordinate system, that and the, the scene graph system itself. Um, and we have a demo here where if you were to hit play, you would see these blocks that kind of fall in line with the coordinate system. Um, so that's important to know when you're using this as a resource. Um, like I said, we do have these standard resources that are listed here. So you have these mesh resources. They can be cubes, spheres. I think we have a, a vector, like a line resource. We have um, a, a wireframe cube resource that you can use. These are all primitives that we've just thrown into the system. So if anyone wants to just test and see if something shows up, they can use that, or, or actually in a, a VR applet. We also have materials. Um, I'll go a little bit further into materials. Uh, actually, I'll do that now. It, we, we have three material types. Uh, we have emissive materials, we have um, directional light-based materials and image, uh, Fong image-based materials. Uh, the difference between the image-based materials and directional light-based uh, materials is the lighting source. So if you throw an object into the scene and you say, oh, you know, I want the lighting to be with regards to the world, then you would use directional lighting. The image-based lighting just uses the scene lighting itself uh, as lighting for the material. And then emissives uh, don't actually, um, of course, use any of the lighting from the global scene or the actual scene. Um, so we have a material uh, standard resources for each of those, except for the um, Fong uh, image base uh, materials. And for that, uh, actually, I'll just go into the materials here. So for Fong materials, for the image based ones, you actually have to create uh, that image in engine, um, in code. So you would describe the material here and then you would basically use that descriptor to initialize a material. Um, so here, in a little bit more detail, you can assign the material a material name, uh, you can give it a spec, um, 
based on some of the primitives that we already have loaded. And then you can also change certain properties like it's diffuse color, it's specular uh, color, it's ambient color. So we have that as a, an available resource. Uh, next we have texture resources, really basic, um, just a list of textures that we have for creating more advanced textures, but you can use that to basically test if you know the texture system is actually working for you or you know if you wanted to see some material against a, a, or some mesh against a certain checkered pattern texture and see if it's uh, outlined the right way. Um, we also have uh, blueprint, uh, blueprint resources and that's more along the lines of creating like a blank s a scene object. So if you want to create a scene graph where you have this parent that's a blank parent but you want to attach other objects to it, you can create a, a blank uh, blueprint for that. And then finally we have the uh, option to load models in, uh, kind of what JJ briefly talked about. Um, we use these .evr files, which are special to our engine, um, to take objects in and show them. But if you, you know, want to create a .evr file, you can basically take any, you know, FBX or OBJ file, anything that loads into Unity, and we have a special conversion tool that can push that object into Eve. There's more details about how you can actually go about loading those objects into Eve using that tool, and we have that in the content pipeline. I'm not going to cover it because I know uh, we're kind of limited on time here. Um, so you have the ability to load models, and you, you can do that by reference. And then finally, um, you know, like I said, once you create your models, once you create calls to Eve, you're going to want to clean up your system resources that you're taking. So whenever you create a call, you're using a bit of RAM. We have this little um, dot dispose method uh, for our scene objects, and that helps to release the handle. Um, so I'll just get straight into showing you some examples of um, some prototypes and little widgets that we created internally that actually make use of this SDK. And I'll kind of go through what aspects of those uh, samples are, are using certain parts of the SDK. So go through. So the first thing I'll show you is one of the demos that we actually have there in the back. Um, it's a block builder demo that was uh, created by Aaron sitting there. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and basically what it is, is it's just kind of like a Minecraft-esque builder. You can have this little plate in front of you you could take cubes and make them certain colors and build a model. And the cool thing about this too is that you can actually share the model with other people. So after you've created your own model and someone else has the SDK, you can just um, go to the page and create a little URL link and that person can take the link and see the model and then build on top of it and send it back to you. So that's a cool thing. Um, this kind of shows off a, a great example of how our scene graph works. So if you look here, this this plate was actually loaded in as a .evr file, and that was actually created in Unity. So it was an OBJ file, I believe, and then it was converted. Yeah, okay. so so it's one of Unity's primitive, primitives that was uh, converted into a, a .evr. Um, we have that acting as, I believe, the, the parent object, and then we have other objects that are kind of li uh, attached to it. Um, and so this kind of shows how the scene graph works in that sense. You see, I kind of like put some cubes on top of the plate and then rotated it. So sort of like what JJ already showed with the scene graph, you can move other objects with respect to it. And it's really useful for putting objects on top of another and uh, moving it around. Same thing goes for attaching cubes to each other. Uh, you can also see that um, he's using two uh, standard mesh resources. So he's using a wireframe cube to actually show where you might be placing a cube. And then he's also using the actual cubes to, uh, the actual cube mesh to actually instantiate the cubes on top of the plate. Um, and so if I pause it here, I'm going to pause it where you can see the uh, handles there. So you can kind of see those little handles that, that popped out, the blue and the, the red ones. You can use those to actually scale the plate 
And since it's in a scene graph, the, the objects will actually scale with it. So you can build a little house that's the small, but then scale it to, to go inside of it, right? So um, this is just one example of how you can build on the SDK and one of some of the things that you can do with it. Um, one of the other things I want to quickly show you here is the Excel plugin, which I believe is also in the back computer. I, I actually made this one. Um, where's it? So with the Excel plugin, we're using a number of uh, things that I already mentioned. Yeah. So block builder. Um, but essentially, we're using a list of primitives yeah. in the plot. So we're going to click on the scatter plot here. You can see there are primitive spheres that are generated. We also have these XYZ objects that were loaded as .evr files. The, the axes themselves are, are primitives. And of course, this is in a scene graph, so you can rotate. some 2008 election data, well, 2008 election data, and I wanted to see, you know, can we show that data in a compelling way in which you can kind of understand it in a different way? So, you know, how can we see how economics ties to partisan ideology? So this is just a There's sound with this. This is a, <laughs> I'm gonna mute that. So this is an example of, um, uh, I took an SVG loader that I, I created a while ago and said, okay, can we take um, the fact that you can make particular geometry, any type of geometry that you want on this engine, and take the SVG loader and, and make it make geometry on this um, S through the SDK? And that's exactly what we did here. So um, the states actually came in as an SVG file, just of the United States, just an image. And I read through that and said, okay, can we create geometry through that? So this is actually using the, um, the ability to create geometry through the SDK. And that's kind of what uh, JJ briefly talked about. Um, everything else that applied to the other graph applies to this. So, you know, it's in a scene graph, you can scale it, um, move it around. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you guys the, these simple applets to show that, um, you know, I created the, the Excel plugin in a matter of, you know, a few weeks. He, he created the uh, block builder in, you know, uh, less than two or three weeks. And um, it's just really easy to prototype some, some interesting ideas uh, in VR just using this SDK. Uh, we'll open the floor to some questions if you guys have any. Um, any specific to building on the SDK. I know that was a little bit rushed, but I'm trying to make sure that we make time here. So, any questions? With the oh. I was like, are we it? <laughs> yeah, there's there there is music with that video, but you don't have to hear it. I'll I'll force you to hear it later. So. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, does Envelop interact with like the window, Windows windowing system, or how do you actually get uh, the windows and visualize them in inside Envelop? I guess without giving everything away. So how how deep, how much are you talking to Windows specifically, and at what level? Yeah, like? that's it's tricky. There's multiple ways to do it, and we use all of them. So. Uh, I can't go into too much detail, but you know, there's certain APIs you can leverage to grab window contents. So. Um, wow. <laughs> Hi. Works. Yeah, it works. So uh, I saw that you could import Unity objects and prefabs into uh, your guys' engine and use it. So did you say you can also do the logic and 
the actual the create um, 3D scenes and, and whatever else, a game, for instance, like the Black Builder, and then just import that into Envelop to be used with the SDK and used on a website. Are you talking like in Unity? Do the yeah, 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 like develop yeah. completely in Unity. So like the Black Builder is all JavaScript running in the browser, but right. if you wanted to do it in Unity, we do have a .NET uh, API layer, and we do have the DLLs compiled for Unity. So you have your assemblies that target us. Um, so you can do your logic in Unity, run it headless or whatever, and then use us to do the rendering. So um, you would still have to get the content across, like the objects and stuff like that, either through sending you know the mesh across and the materials across. So there's still a little bit of a translation layer there, but if you wanted to use like a lot of their um, already existing game engine type stuff, you can use that. Um, for all of the application logic and things like that. We actually have with the, the Unity exporter plugin, um, you can visualize the model that you're going to export using the connection through the SDK. So um, as part of exporting, you can preview from within Unity and that will load it into Envelop Live. So that's the same kind of connection that you would use if you actually wanted to build your app entirely in Unity. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> just kind of fills out the team. We have like a whole slide with him like. <laughs> He's the demo master. So. so what is asynchronous programming and why do I as a non-programmer care? Mm, that's a good question. You won't throw up when you use a web page that tries to render in VR using our stuff. Um, Slower and one more time. So, so um, if the web page is really heavy or something like that, and it's only able to send things across at like 20 frames a second, um, we're still running 90 frames a second, you know. Uh, uh, so, you want me to take a stab at this as a non-programmer? Yeah, go for yeah. it. <laughs> so, uh, one of the key differences differences between synchronous and asynchronous. If you're programming synchronously, that means you need to care about the frame rate, right? So. Right. Well, yeah, basically. So we're running at 90 frames per second. If you're doing VR, you want to be running at a high frame rate. If you're programming synchronously, you need to have the expertise in order to make sure that you're adhering to that 90 frame per second restriction. So you're doing things in chunks that fit within 90 frames per second. Right. You need a lot of expertise to do that. You need to be a graphics person. You need to know game engines, all that sort of stuff. Or Unity needs to do the heavy lifting for you. With asynchronous, you don't need to do that, do that sort of thing. You can go in and say, hey, make this object appear, and then we go ahead and make the object appear. We worry about keeping it on 90 frames per second. You say, do these sorts of interactions with the object. You don't need to care about how long it takes. right? That's on our side of things to do that. So people that are web programmers, they're used to doing that sort of thing. Like, put, make these images appear here. Put this text here. They don't necessarily care about adhering to some sort of frame rate, um, and that's what we're enabling. Does that make sense? Okay. If I may, you are synchronizing it yeah. for us. We're handling the synchronous becomes, part. Then it becomes asynchronous. Yes. We don't worry about it. We're not right. chunking it. That's what one does when right. one synchronizes it. Right. And it's also it's event-driven, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you say, hey, when this happens, let me know, uh, and then you can run your logic here. But again, you don't need to know that it's uh, you're adhering to this 90 frame per second restriction. But that said, like if you're creating tilt brush in a browser or something like that, you know, you still want it to be pretty responsive. So you still want your you know your application logic to be pretty tight, um, but you don't have to be perfect about it. So. And actually, a really good example. Um, a really good example of this is the block builder. Um, it's set up so that you can lay down, you know, a, a large volume of blocks in one go. And if that was synchronous, you would probably tank the frame rate while it was instantiating, you know, 300 blocks at once. But because it's asynchronous, even though I'm sending all of those instantiation calls back to back, they're handled asynchronously with an envelop in a way that doesn't disrupt that frame rate. So worst case scenario, you may have some lag in the actual um, interaction where 
your, your interaction events get queued up and you have to wait for them to finish. But while you're waiting for the interaction to catch up, you're not going to be hurling because the frame rate is making you nauseous. Right. Okay. Let me throw in one quick thing here. Like One of the things that we like to talk about is that this is really democratizing VR development. Like If you're a web developer, you could use our SDK to do things in VR. Right, and really, for my money, that's about as simple as it's going to get, right? To get into into VR, and I think that that's a that's a huge thing because right now you need to have some Unity expertise or um, Web VR. Is that synchronous? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we're really trying to make it so that you don't need to have a bunch of VR experience to extend into VR because we want people like web developers and go say, hey, hey, how do I easily exp extend my web page into VR? This is the easiest way. I think it was fairly recently that Google announced that they were really proud that they got the browser running 90. So, so I, I think we're a little ahead of the game there. So. Um, yeah, two questions. First of all, I'm not really at all familiar with how Excel works or how to bind into it. So I was just wondering if you'd be able to walk through like how you get Excel data piped over into this because everything else seems to be web driven. Yeah, so there was an API that um, that basically allowed me to get Excel information in C sharp, right? Hmm. And through that, um, I used the C sharp SDK to instantiate uh, EVR objects. So that's like the most general um, description of it. Um, so so you can use a number of APIs that work with Excel to get Excel data to get um, what color a certain cell is on a spreadsheet to get the spreadsheet name. And then we basically just tie that with the fact that there's an SDK that can help you instantiate objects. I don't know if that helps. No, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Let me add one thing on there. Like, so Excel, the key thing is that Excel has a plugin model, right? right so right. Excel's written to have plugins to extend it. Any application really that has a plugin model or things that could potentially be extended into VR using our SDK today. Right, and most applications that are trying to be, I think, widely used on the scale of Office or like big uh, graphics or 3D editing programs have plugin models because they want developers to be able to extend it. Uh, so anything that has that sort of model, you could write to our SDK and extend into VR today. Yeah. Cool, cool. And then secondly, uh, I'm not too familiar with what A-Frame is doing, but it sounds like there's some overlap. Um, I haven't actually looked into A-Frame yet. Oh, okay. So, I didn't sorry. know. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if there's anything that you guys have been able to glean from that community or from that. From So yeah. personally, when I've used A-Frame, um, and, you know, excuse me if I'm wrong, from what I've seen, a lot of the web VR and A-Frame applications are full 360 experiences, right? So as soon as you go to a page, that page consumes your view. You can't go to a second page, right? I think the differences that you'll see between this and what you can do on web VR on A-Frame is that you can have multiple pages open and run VR instances from those pages all together. So that- While your YouTube is playing in the background. Right. So. Right, I, th I think that's one of the key things that we're really trying to do with Envelop for Windows, and I was talking about this earlier before the presentation, is that there's a lot of content out there that there's value in viewing in 3D in a VR sort of format that's not necessarily compelling if you're dedicated to it, right? So I think Excel is a perfect example of this. I like data, I like visualizations. I don't really wanna load up a VR version of Excel, right? I don't wanna be like, oh, well, I'm gonna spend the next 10, 15, 30 minutes in an Excel experience, right? I want that as part of the rest of access to my computer, right? So I think that there's a lot of stuff that's compelling to see in VR, but not necessarily be dedicated to in VR. And I think that's one of the key differentiator of, uh, differentiators of what we're going through is that there's not a lot of people out there that are taking that approach. Everything in VR right now is very siloed. It's very, you're in this experience and that's all you're doing. Right, so I think that there's uh, some a lot of compelling use cases for things like that. The other thing that I think that's interesting related to that is that um, if you look at things like, let's say, a VR room configurator, let's say IKEA.com is working on a VR room configurator. That's great if you want to furnish your house with IKEA, right? Maybe you might want a little variety there with something like if IKEA.com uses our SDK to 
uh, visualize their furniture and have a room configurator, well, you could potentially also go to crateandbarrel.com, and if they're using our SDK as well, have objects appear in that shared environment, right? And actually maybe try and like have some variety rather than locked into one vendor. So I think there's a lot of scenarios that are interesting there. I think that that's something that you're eventually going to see. Um, we're just trying to enable the platform for that sort of stuff. Thank you. Yeah.